Prabhakar Raghavan, head of Yahoo Research, as our distinguished speaker today. So Prabhakar uh, is, uh, is the editor of the Journal of the SEM, editor in chief. He's a he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and he's a fellow of the IEEE and ACE. Um, among many Prabhakar's many seminal contributions, let me briefly mention some that are closest to my research interests. So Prabhakar introduced uh, two uh, major algorithmic techniques. One is called uh, randomized rounding. The other is called the theory of pessimistic estimators. So randomized rounding has become a major tool in, the, in designing approximation algorithms for NPR optimization problems. Uh, theory of pessimistic estimators uh, is a very nice technique uh, that can be used to construct deterministic algorithms from randomized algorithms. In other words, to de-randomize randomized algorithms. Uh, so Prabhakar wrote a textbook on randomized algorithms uh, in 1995 that was published in 1995 uh, that has been very influential in shaping how we think about algorithms. And uh, I was actually an undergraduate at IIT Madras in, in the early 90s. I got hold of a copy of it and uh, I got hooked on randomized algorithms and I've been doing research in randomized algorithms ever since. Uh, so let me finish by mentioning uh, two important works uh, in my career that that has been uh, that I've done in collaboration with uh, Prabhakar. The first one is on peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, we gave some efficient protocols for designing peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks. That was probably the first theory paper in peer-to-peer -peer networks. And the second is on designing new and accurate models for the World Wide Web. I mean, that has been quoted a lot since we published that. And uh, indeed, Prabhakar and his team has been at the forefront of developing the theory of the web. I mean, they have done almost all the important works in, in developing the theory of the web. And today is going to talk about uh, new sciences for a new web. Thanks, Gopal, for that kind introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Can, good. So uh, uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, actually what I do for a living. I, I'm supposed to figure out uh, essentially the science roadmap for an internet company. And uh, let me show you my prettiest slide. After this, it goes downhill from here. Uh, so very roughly, uh, the, the conclusion I'm coming to after having spent a little over three years on my job uh, is that what we think of when we think of companies like Google and Yahoo and you know, the internet part of Microsoft is largely computation. But there's a pretty healthy dose of, of uh, what I'll call the rational, which is the theory of microeconomics, and the behavioral, a lot of the social sciences. And what I'm going to do over the next hour or so is illustrate a number of examples of some of the biggest problems we face and, and the scientific challenges that come about at the nexus of these three broad areas. All right, so, so let's begin. Uh, what do companies like mine do? Well, on, we really manage two supply chains. On the one side, we have members of an audience arriving. Uh, so these are people like you and me who come to the internet. And for our purposes, uh, these people do kind of three broad categories of activities. So one is they consume, passively come and consume news and information. So you show up at the homepage of a portal or your ISP, there's a bunch of news there, uh, and it's not like you had anything in mind. You're kind of looking for what's out there. The second is what I call communicate on networks. So this is activities like you know, classical email to IM to Facebook. Uh, so you're, you're kind of networking. You're communicating with uh, peers and friends and so on. And the third uh, behavior that we observe is what I call transact, where you're actively looking for something, and, and the most prototypical experience in, in this bucket of transactive search. Okay? And, and we'll have occasion to talk uh, uh, about at least two of these in some detail. Now, that's sort of one half of the picture. On the other half, we have people who provide news and information and services. Okay? And, and I put these dollar numbers next to them, and I'll explain what that means in a second. Right? So these are people who might be commercial providers of news feeds. They could also be all of us with our home pages, so we create web pages, we create information. We think of that as being freely available. From the standpoint of a company like ours, uh, just want to be clear that 
although the information may be free, putting together the infrastructure and the communications and the data centers to actually acquire that information costs us money. So there's actually a price associated with it. Okay? Uh, now, one of the dollar amounts there is negative, and that is meant to signify a form of information provider known as an advertiser. This is somebody who's willing to pay you money to put their information out there, right? And what we do, uh, in the case of Yahoo, about six billion times a day, is to provide a matchmaking service, a real-time matchmaking service. As each member of the audience arrives, we juxtapose a bunch of content and information and advertising to show to the audience member who just arrived. Okay? And that real-time matchmaking service is performed by a whole bunch of companies, um, uh, certainly Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, uh, some of these other companies, AOL, you know. IAC is, the, is a holding company that holds a whole bunch of uh, uh, service providers, including Ask Jeeves, a search engine. And this logo just above Yahoo, some of you may recognize it, is the News Corporation, which is uh, Rupert Murdoch's company that owns MySpace, among other things. Okay. So, so that's sort of the landscape that we're playing in. Okay. Um, what's the promise here? How does this differ from traditional broadcast and print media? Well, first of all, there's a measurable and auditable notion of fulfillment. Okay. What I'll explain later on is we're not very good at this, but today, as a first proxy, we look at things like how often do people click on links, how often do people, how long do people hang around on a page, and so on. Okay. So there is some notion of measurability that's more sophisticated than I mailed you a copy of a magazine and I don't know if you ever opened it. Okay. Uh, there's a notion of targetability that you know something about what this user is trying to do. When somebody takes the trouble to type in two keywords into a search engine, they're actually taking a lot of trouble to tell you what they're looking for. There's a point about scale that I hope you'll begin to appreciate as we go through this talk, uh, but there's a virtuous cycle in statistics you can learn and infer about audience behavior. There's also a virtuous cycle that comes about on the advertiser side when you have lots and lots of advertisers competing for attention. That leads to what we call picker markets, uh, and, and that leads eventually to finer targeting. And in that context, bidding and pricing, which we'll talk about later, are mechanisms where advertisers can signal how much they're willing to pay uh, in an irrational environment for a particular quality of match, the match with an audience member. OK, so here's the, the agenda for this talk. We'll go through essentially four pieces. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about search and what's changing in search, how it's evolving from two keywords retrieving 10 documents to something uh, a little more intense. Okay. Uh, then we'll talk about audience attention. How do you measure the attention of audience that you have? Uh, we'll t t say uh, something briefly about heavy tail distributions that keep coming up in this setting. And, and we'll end up by talking about some aspects of what I call computation microeconomics. There's a whole host of really exciting challenges that come up there. And I'm going to kind of scratch the surface and hopefully whet your appetite just enough to go and look at all the really fascinating stuff going on there. All right, so, so let me begin, uh, plunge into uh, search. Okay. Uh, this is a search on Microsoft's live for Latin canon. And I'm using this just to set terminology, not to show you how bad their engine is. This is actually a hard query. If you look at uh, the query Latin canon, the top results uh, that all the search engines will give you are uh, Canon's headquarters in Latin America and so on, which has nothing to do with Latin Canon, as uh, some of you probably know. But really, the, the thing I want to point you to is when you hit a search, we're giving you two sets of results. The, the results on the left are what we call the algorithmic results. These are drawn from the web collection and are the 10 or so links that the engine, in this case Microsoft Live, thinks of as the best 10 results for this query. On your right, we have a different uh, retrieval problem. What we're doing is reaching into an ad database and pulling out the ads that seem to best match this query. Okay? And so I want you to maintain in your mind a, an algorithmic results side, which fetches the audience to come to the search engine. And then the monetization, which is the advertisements, which is how, in this case, Microsoft Live makes its money. Okay? Uh, this is very similar to classical broadcast and print media, where you have the editorial content, and then separately you have the advertising, which is how they monetize. Okay? And so for terminology, the algorithmic results are the stuff on the left, advertisements on the right. And we'll, for the moment, just talk about the stuff on the left. And the last part of the talk, we'll discuss the advertisements. Okay? 
All right. Um, so uh, the technical underpinnings of these two retrieval problems have a lot in common. There's some information retrieval in machine learning, and we'll dive into it uh, a little bit more. But actually, these retrieval problems are quite different. The incentive systems uh, are, are different, as I'll point out later. On the left-hand side, the people providing the content are trying to game the system and rank themselves high. On the right-hand side, the advertisers are typically trying to work closely with the search engine in ways I'll detail. And we'll talk about both of these as we go along. Okay? But for now, we'll begin by talking about the algorithmic results only. Okay? Now, before I jump in there, I want to do a little bit of technical level setting, because when I look at, at the distribution of papers published, there's uh, certain misconceptions that come up often, right? Uh, the first, and these are important principles to understand if we try to figure out what research questions are really the interesting ones. Okay, my first point here is the query distribution has a heavy tail, okay? Um, what do I mean by that? So, so if you take all query strings from the most frequently asked query to the least and you plot this, this query distribution has a heavy tail. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, so the expected number of times a query string is seen by a search engine is actually under 10. Okay, so take the expectation over all query strings of the number of times that string is seen, it's under 10. Okay. So you might say, well, here's my recipe for building a successful search engine. Let me just take the more common queries, anything that's asked at least 100 times, and do a really great job on those and ignore these things that are seldom asked. Okay? Uh, that's not going to work. And the reason is that these infrequently asked queries, the queries asked fewer than 100 times or any fixed constant number of times, will together add up to a whole lot of probability mass. So you're throwing away like 30 or 40% of your market, and your audience goes away. Okay? So that's what I mean by heavy tail distribution. So what that points to is anything that we do has to have a certain element of generality to it. Attacking a one-person niche and getting really good is not good enough. All right. Uh, the second and a very different point I want to make is there's, there's a bit of a myth out there that you know, since Google has invented PageRank and uh, it's mathematically elegant, ranking is done by PageRank. In fact, that's not true. Okay. Um, the reality is most search engines use machine learning to devise the ranking functions. Uh, and you take into account literally hundreds of factors, uh, including you know, things like tests of spam quality for the content provider. You take into account things like you know, who's clicking on which documents. You take into account you know, boldface and all this good stuff, as well as link analysis, of course, to come up with fairly sophisticated ranking functions that actually will change several times a month. Okay. How do you do this with machine learning? Well. You set up a gold standard editorial, editorially annotated collection of queries and documents. So editors sit, look at queries and documents and say, yep, this document is relevant for this query. This document is irrelevant for this query, and so on. And then you throw your features into some machine learning algorithm that regresses on this, annotation, on this set of annotations and devices the ranking function. Okay? And, and a lot of the secret sauce and hard work that goes on in our ranking teams is actually devising good features. Okay? So it's not that PageRank is a single signal of quality by itself. PageRank is one of you know, certainly hundreds of factors. Okay? Now the last point is for those of you who uh, are more in an information retrieval uh, mold of uh, thinking. Uh, classically in information retrieval, we think of binary judgments. We say this document is relevant or not for this query. Uh, to actually carry through some of the things we're already doing, and in fact, stuff I'm going to talk about in a moment, we have to get much more fine-grained than simply relevant or not. Uh, one thing that we've recognized is whether a document is relevant to a query is kind of independent of whether the, the document is authoritative as a source of information. Okay? Uh, so you could have a whole bunch of documents that are relevant, but somehow you want to promote the more authoritative ones to be higher up in your results. Okay. So these are some of the factors where classical information retrieval is not giving us quite the nuance that we'd like to, to get things moving. All right. Um, so the premise that I want to start with is that in search, we're moving from an era of looking at content to looking at intent. Okay. And in particular, people don't want to 
just search. They don't come into work every day saying, let me search. They don't go home and say, let me do some searches. They actually want to get things done. They want to run their lives, right? So you want to book your vacation, you want to find your job, whatever it is. And so it's, search is a digression. It's a means to the end of getting your task done. Okay? And I have this toy example. I'll just put it up here, right? So from start to finish, uh, you have this task in mind. You want to book a vacation in Tuscany. Uh, you might spend days and maybe even weeks doing this, in the course of which you make recourse to many information sources, many search engines, whatever it is, right? And what's going on here over and over again is in the course of completing your task, you as a human are assimilating information from lots and lots of sets of results that these engines throw up at you, parking it in your head or in scraps of paper or whatever. And you spend hours while these CPUs at all these search engines are together spending five seconds of their time, right? So there's something uh, inequitous about this, right? Especially, as I'll point out in a moment, a lot of the stuff you're doing for them are actually fairly mechanizable, okay? So what we want to do is get to a point where we're not just forcing you to sift through content, but trying to understand and address your intent, okay? All right, so what does this take? Okay. So I'll give you a couple of examples, which are baby steps in this direction. One example from Yahoo and one from Google, where the results we give you are already more than just a list of 10 documents. Okay? And what I want you to see from these examples is we are moving towards identifying a user's task, as expressed in the keyword query, and then enabling a means for task completion. So let me begin with the Yahoo example, then the Google example. Now let's step back and ask what kind of framework does it take in terms of information integration to actually service needs of this kind. Okay. So here's the first example. So if you were to go to Yahoo search and type Papa John's, okay, how many people here know what Papa John's is? Okay, good. So it's a pizza chain, right? Uh, so, well, it's nice we give you the home page as the top results. That's not surprising. Finding home pages is a well-solved task today, right? Uh, but I want you to look right below the top results. Top, well, actually, to the right of the top result. Uh, if you look carefully, it says Papa John's, and it says NASDAQ PZZA. Okay. So we said, all right, maybe this person is a potential investor who wants to find out about the financials of Papa John's. Okay, so let's give them a link. In addition to all the 10 links that we, you know, 10 documents we found, let's give them a link that teleports them to financial information. Okay. So maybe the intent underlying this query is financial. So let's give a link that will take you to the Yahoo Finance page and gives you, gives you all the financials. Okay? Now, there could be a different intent that this user has. And if you look a little further down, oh, come on. I'm going to kill this. OK. Uh, in fact, let me do this. So uh, if you look up, where did the cursor go? OK. If you look up there, there's a link that says Papa John's near you. Okay, so maybe the user is just hungry and wants to order pizza. Okay, so that's a link we synthesized, knowing something about this query. Okay, and if you were to actually click on that link, you get to something like this, which shows you a map. The star is where it thinks I live, and it's actually correct. And in ranked order of distance are the Papa John's outlets based on their distance from where I live. Okay, so this is enabling a means of completing the task of buying your pizza and cutting your hunger. Right. So the engine somehow decided that there's a couple of potential intents behind this query. So besides giving you the 10 links, it gave you a little bit more so that you don't have to go into these documents, read them, pull out phone numbers, say, OK, which one's close to me, and then call the one nearby. Right? OK, so two instances. Let me give you a different example, this one from Google. Right? Um, so I've got this rather cryptic query in there. It says SFO BOS APR25. Right? Uh, so those of you who travel, and I'm sure there's lots of this, uh, people here, know that SFO is the airport code for San Francisco International Airport, BOS for Boston Logan. APR presumably is April, right? Um, so the algorithmic results Google gives, which are down below, are pretty much gibberish in this case. But then they do one nice thing, which is they say, OK, it looks like you're looking for flights from San Francisco to Boston. Let me fill out a form for you, put in some dates based on what you've told me, and you can go ahead and buy. So this is taking you again to task completion. Not making you look for lots of services and then go to them one by one. Okay, all right. So that's a setting. Now these are baby steps. In in all engines, you can find for certain kinds of queries, we trap them aside and do special things. You know, so-called direct displays of this kind. Right. But I argued at the beginning that generality is critical. So so let's try to 
understand uh, what this might take. Okay. So as we begin to get towards richer experiences of this kind, right, I'm going to take an example. Uh, and this is sort of a joke example. Uh, so the joke example is you're in Rome uh, and you're looking for Pizza Hut. Uh, the reason it's a joke is the Pizza Hut company does not operate in Italy. Uh, they, they don't exist. Okay, so there is no Pizza Hut in Rome. But uh, let's say there were. Right? Uh, so it's got a home page, right? And, and today we do a bunch of indexing and parsing on that. So we even get to the point of saying, well, that's the business name, and we know something about it. We say there's a geo, we can pull out some map information, and so on. So all of this stuff, through, through decent entity ex extraction, we can do today. Okay. But there's more to this, right? Uh, if you, in today's search engines, for the most part, if you hit a query like Pizza Hut Rome, assuming there were one, you would get this home page as the top result and then a whole bunch of others that mention it. Okay? And in particular, there's a host of pages around the web that annotate this home page in various ways, typically reviews, some of which say this place is great, some of which say it sucks, whatever, right? Uh, when a user comes in looking for Pizza Hut in Rome, they're looking for a composite picture that exists in the collective consciousness of the web, not just a series of results. Okay? How do we synthesize all this material, right? So here we get to a harder problem because there's stuff in all these pages that refer to an object, namely the Pizza Hut in Rome. Okay, and we have to somehow denormalize that, figure that out, and recognize that all the stuff in these pages really pertains to this object. And it's not easy, and I'll show you this in a second. Right? Once you do that, then at query time, maybe you have a whole bunch of queries. So you're watching a user hit a whole bunch. And it's really fascinating to look at query logs, unfortunately. If you're in academia, you don't get to do this. But if you look at query logs, you, you learn some very interesting things about what people are doing. So let's throw this into a black box, I'll call it, called sessional analysis, which where you use some you know, ideas from machine learning. And it spits out an intent plus some attributes. right? So the intent of this user is they want to buy pizza there in Rome. right? What you want to do is present to this user a composite experience. And I don't mean this as a UI, because I don't know anything about UI. But the collective of information is not only what you found in the home page, but also this reviews and stuff that you found from around the web. Right? Now, this turns out to be pretty challenging. Okay. Uh, a classic reason is if you go to any European city, say Paris, there's a hotel called Rome. And if you go to Rome, there's a hotel called Paris. Right? So when you see a page for Rome or a review for Rome Hotel Paris, you don't know which of these two objects it's talking about. Right? That's a typical instance. Uh, deduping, it's not quite deduping, but a normalization instance for why it's difficult to do this. So let's start looking at uh, what some of the hard problems that come up are. Right? So we move from a web of pages that are connected by links to a web of objects, physical objects. Right? Now, these objects are people, places, businesses, universities. They have attributes that you glean from the web that are noisy. And the thesis is the intent is satisfied by juxtaposing the objects that pertain, uh, pertain to the, the intent. Okay. okay. Uh, so here's a bunch of hard problems. Let me start with general ones and then get to the more the CS type of problems. Right? How do you model intent? We don't have a good way of doing this. Everything I've told you is by example, right? You want to buy pizza, that's a good example. But what really is the cognitive view that a user has when they have a task in mind? What is the right way of bucketing intents, right? Uh, what are the top intents? If you go talk to some of our editors who stare at query logs all the time, they have a pretty good idea. But that's more like impression based on looking at lots of queries. We don't have any, any real analytical technique for getting at this. Um, today, when we show you a bunch of search results, the way we measure happiness is did people actually click on results, did they click on results closer to the top, and so on. Right? In this more composite view world where I bring together a bunch of objects, right, how do I measure your happiness? Right? Uh, do I get to do look at transactions? Do I do user studies and interviews? Certainly, track style binary relevance. Track is a classic information retrieval contest every year. Uh, is inadequate. It's not a question of was the page that we showed you relevant or not. Uh, there's always going to be relevant elements on it. Okay. Um, on more the computer science side of it, if you think about this web of objects that represent physical entities, what's the right data model? 
right? What are the right kinds of relationships? Uh, you, you're somehow stuck between capturing enough richness in this model to come up with useful experiences here. But on the other hand, you don't want to re reproduce psych and try to codify all language and all human knowledge uh, because you're never going to get there. We want something that's computationally tractable. At the same time, uh, it's got to be rich enough. Okay? How do you infer trust and reliability? The, the big issue here is when you have 10,000 reviews for Pizza Hut Rome, which ones are the reliable ones? Which ones should you cast aside? Okay. Uh, if you think about scoring, uh, in the current world of scoring 10 results, the primary tool at some level is linear algebra, right? Variations of linear algebra learning from, uh, ranging from eigenvectors for you know, link analysis and so on, all the way to we use, like everybody does, ranked SVMs for uh, ranking pages. Uh, what in this world is the right way of juxtaposing the objects to create an experience? Okay. We don't understand this yet. Uh, what is the automated framework for relevance? I told you at the beginning that today we show you a gold set and then try to regress on that to learn a ranking function. Well, what's the right uh, relevance framework in this world? We don't understand most of this stuff. Okay. All right. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a flavor of where we are thinking about search and some of the hard problems there. Uh, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about the passive consumption of news and entertainment, uh, what I call anti-social media, right? Because you're sort of passively consuming on your own. Okay, so this is your typical example. If you had gone to the Yahoo homepage yesterday, you would have gotten something like this. Okay. Now, what does it mean to have an engaged audience? And this is something that uh, we really worry about, right? So in the broadcast world, in television, it's the number of hours you watch in print, it's circulation. Uh, today on the internet, it's we measure page views, we measure hours that you're spending on a website. You might say, who cares? And the answer is that advertisers and publishers care about this stuff, right? Uh, why do they care? Well, because advertisers uh, are interested in things like, I want you know, a million eyeballs on Christmas Day, I want male eyeballs, I want males less than 25 years, and so on. And you say, why? Why do they care about these demographic buckets? Because in search, when you type two keywords, you know pretty much what the person is after. But if somebody just shows up at a news page without telling you what they're after, you really don't know what they're after. Okay. Uh, you're probably not going to buy a car on average for another five years, but every day when you go to a web page, GM and Toyota and Ford are there reminding you of their existence. Okay. So you might wonder why they do that. Okay. Uh, and, and the theory is that consumers go through various phases of decision before they transact. And this is what marketeers call the funnel of decisions. So you begin by, by promoting awareness, like Ford is making you aware of their existence every day. And then over the course of the next five years, you decide which car to buy. And as you get closer and closer to your transaction, you winnow down your choices to the one car you're going to buy. But early on, everything's fair game, so people keep reminding you. So the goal of awareness advertising or brand advertising is to simply keep you aware of of things you might be interested in, right? And that's why they're interested in male eyeballs under 25, whatever, okay? On the web, today we are extremely primitive. We are kind of at the top row where we look at the number of page views. So for instance, we sell advertising by the number of page views, uh, by repeat visits maybe. But you can imagine, and sociologists start to think about increasing levels of engagement on the web, right? So if you click through, that somehow connotes more engagement. If you generate content, like you go to a blog and leave a bit of content, that's even more engagement. Content transport through networks, that is, I see a story, I like it, and I recommend it to a friend. Okay? That's considered even more engagement, and so on. Do right? you actually go and create a user ID? That's still more engagement. Right? So there's all these different things you can measure about whether a user is engaged, whether an audience is engaged. Okay? How do you boil it down to something simple, a quantity that you can then go to sell to an advertiser? Okay. Um, so how about something like this? The number of repeats times the time they spend times the number of neighbors they have in their email network, right? Uh, and you say, well, where did that come from? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know, I just made it up, right? It's completely ungrounded in psychology of any kind. Uh, but yet, what we need is the cognitive psychology study that helps us get to better metrics of this kind. 
that tell us the value, in a sense, of, of an audience from things we can measure. Okay. Um, so what, in a sense, we're looking for is the science of measuring engagement for an online audience. And it's not just about people interacting with computers. So that was HCI uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but really, you're interacting with news and in information. You're interacting with other people. And the point that I cannot stress enough is that this is intrinsically data-driven, right? What I mean by that is in classical social sciences, people do tend to create studies by interviewing 30 people and then spending three years writing a thesis. Here, you don't get to take three years to do anything. Uh, and you certainly don't get to interview anybody, pretty much. But you do get to look at 30 million people. So on TAP, I can give you lots of users, and you can run a few control experiments. Right? Uh, how do you shift from that classical world of the social sciences to this world that's intrinsically data-driven? Right? Um, so in our setting, the, this is actually a lacuna where most research in the classical fields remains qualitative, interview-based, small-scale, and, and extremely manually intensive, whereas what I'm asking here is what can we do uh, with new genres like social networking? Along comes Facebook, and nobody knows what made Facebook take off while 100 other wannabes failed. Right? Uh, there's no shortage of startups in Silicon Valley all trying to do the same thing. Right? YouTube took off, uh, but Google Video didn't. Okay. Why? Uh, Flickr took off, but Yahoo Photos didn't. And, and so the second life and so on, right? So what makes some of these tick and some of these fail? Somehow they manage to get at the essence of engaging the online audience and keeping them drawn in and growing that society in ways that the others didn't. Okay? And the, there's no scientific basis. It kind of feels like in the early days of user interfaces, you throw up a user interface and hope it sticks. Okay? There's no generally accepted principles of here are things you want to avoid and here are some other things you want to do persistently. Okay? So what are some of the big challenges here? So we want to devise and standardize defensible metrics of online engagement okay, and use these to predictively design online experiences. So the next Facebook isn't sort of seat of the pants as much. It's not meant to be a substitute for creativity, but actually have a basis that you can refer to back. Okay. Uh, the kinds of questions that uh, you have to get at and be able to solve are now, there's this claim by Jacob Nielsen and others that users don't notice display advertising. Okay. So do users see these brand advertisements? Right? Um, unless you do massive controlled experiments, among my colleagues, David Riley is doing a whole bunch of these. He's got a million and a half users uh, where he's doing it essentially like a clinical trial. You have control groups and test groups where he turns on varying dosages of display advertising. And he's able to measure the lift in store sales as a function of the amount of display advertising that you're exposed to. Okay? So there's a dosage versus outcome uh, measurement. Okay? Uh, if you've been paying attention to the last few slides, you probably noticed that something went missing here. Uh, how many people noticed anything? OK, a few people noticed, right? That's actually, so, so what was missing there? Uh, it was an example of contextually sensitive display advertising. It was a cover of my new book. Right? And I figured that uh, people in this audience might be somewhat, uh, find that somewhat relevant. Okay? So that's an example of display advertising does leave some impression in people. And, and Riley's experiments actually look at the number of exposures before it starts to register and the number of further exposures before they start to spend dollars. Okay? Uh, his paper is very fascinating. It's just coming out. Uh, but roughly what he's able to show with a large retailer who advertises on Yahoo is that the, the lift in sales is about 10 times the spend in advertising. Uh, so uh, if your profit margin is better than 10%, then you're probably making money from this advertising, right? Which is actually something that's always been a tenuous connection since the 19th century when uh, John Wanamaker made this famous remark about, I know half my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which half, right? OK, um, so that's the book. Uh, uh, let me just uh, touch on, on briefly on an aspect of machine learning and statistical inference that comes up very persistently in all the problems that uh, we look at. And this has to do with, uh, with a phenomenon that's both real but also widely misunderstood. Okay. Uh, it's widely misunderstood in the folklore thanks to books like The Long Tail. Uh, and I'm not blaming Chris Anderson for this because 
I think his book is not technically inaccurate. It's just that people on talk shows and things misunderstand it, right? So I mentioned early on that the expected number of times a query is asked is a constant. But what makes these distributions interesting is that the tail mass is non-trivial. Okay? A distribution being long-tailed is, in some sense, uninteresting. Normal distribution is very long-tailed. Okay? Uh, but the tail mass is tiny. What makes the distributions that we care about interesting is that they actually have a heavy tail, meaning if you cut them off at any constant, you still leave behind a large fraction of probability mass. Okay? All right. Now, this is a phenomenon that I gave as example, the query distribution. But in fact, it comes up over and over again in many aspects. Things like how many times is a website visited, all sorts of social phenomena on the web, how, how po the relative popularities of YouTube videos and so on. Right? And so one observation that I want to put up here uh, sort of as, as a plea for further investigation is in our industry, we keep encountering heavy tail distributions. I'll show you one specific example in a moment. Uh, distributions that people commonly think of as power laws, but you know, they can be log normals. There's, there's a whole family of these things. Most of the math that we tend to model on is sort of the classical distributions, uh, binomials, Poisson's, and normals, right? And this disparity comes back to bite us in a bunch of ways. Okay. All right. So, uh, so let me uh, point to a particular problem that uh, that we try to solve repeatedly, right? What is the likely response of a user to a page view? And we call this response prediction. And in particular, I give you a page. It's got a bunch of links on it. And we are interested in measuring things like, not measuring, predicting things like, what is the probability you click on the top link? Okay. And when I show you the last segment, you'll understand why this problem is extremely important. Okay. Um, now, part of the problem is very often when a user comes along, you've almost never seen this such a user before. If if you think of heavy tail distributions, one of the corollaries is that users can be thought of as falling into buckets, some of which you'll see only 10 users in all of history. Right? You're going to see this kind of user only 10 times in all of history. You've seen three of them before, and now you've got to estimate what the fourth one is going to do. Right? Not really a basis for regular statistics. Okay? On the other hand, you cannot afford to ignore such users, but because if you take all the users falling in buckets of 10 or fewer, that's 40% of your market. Okay, all right. So the specific setting uh, uh, for response prediction. All right. So along comes the user, and they have a bunch of features like what their IP address is. Maybe you know their gender. Maybe you know their age in some cases because they're logged in. So you, you, <clears throat> as is classical machine learning, you think of this person as a point in some feature space. Okay. Except this feature space exhibits what I call long tail sparsity. What I mean by that. <clears throat> is up there to your top left in feature space are some buckets that are full of users. They are the head users. You know, they are the ones who you see all the time. Right? Uh, so these may be the, the you know, very sort of normal people, in a sense. Right? But out to the bottom and to the right, you have these cells, these buckets, where users are extremely rare. You're only going to see 10 of these guys in all of history, uh, in all the existence of your company. Right? Um, so the challenge that you have is when you've seen three users in one of these buckets to the right or to the bottom, you go to predict whether the fourth one is going to click on the link or not. Okay. How do you do this? Right. You cannot learn enough from looking at the three previous users. Okay. So let's say you've even done a perfect job of bucketing them using features and so on. Right. So how do you do this? Now, I'll give you a hint of the, some of the methods that we're trying. And these are sort of the obvious ones. There's some published work out there. Right. Uh, what we end up doing is making recourse to domain information. So for instance, we might say uh, that, well, I don't know whether a male of the age 35 in Lafayette is, is likely to click on a Porsche ad, because I've only seen three such people in all of history. But if I take a geographic neighborhood, okay, and it doesn't have to be geographic, it could be somehow demographic then I can add, aggregate statistics from around. So this is a fairly classical technique. Doing this in a principled way isn't easy. Right? Another thing that we've looked at, uh, is, and this works in some settings, is to look at your social network. So to what extent do people get influenced by what their friends are doing? And therefore, to what extent can I infer your likelihood of a click from what your friends, your instant messenger neighborhood, or your email neighborhood has already done in similar settings? Okay. Those are the. Uh, 
So uh, some of you may have heard of so-called bandit problems, uh, where you try and do exploit exploit trade-offs to estimate these probabilities. Uh, there's an area uh, called hierarchical bandits. These are keywords I'm putting up there if you want to search. Uh, uh, and uh, that's, of course, the, the ultimate pointer to information these days. So if you look for hierarchical bandits, these are ways of looking at the neighborhood of a user, demographic or social neighborhood, and trying to make inferences based on that to estimate these sparse buckets. Okay. All right. So, uh, so some of the challenges we have here, uh, we want to model and analyze these heavy tail distributions. There's a number of models being proposed for heavy tail distributions, and, you know, fairly rigorous ones, uh, going back to Herb Simon in the 50s. Uh, but analyzing uh, the statistics, trying to come up with how do you suck in domain information seems to be much harder. How do you suck in neighborhood information? Right? And we want to use these to devise new audience and uh, uh, monetization mechanisms. I haven't talked about monetization yet. I'm just getting to that. Okay. Uh, and some of the issues you have is that many of the standard in independence assumptions you have in classical probability and statistics cease to be available because you have influences coming to you through a social network from many different directions. And trying to tease that apart can be a pain. So this is another area. Uh, the whole study of the analysis of heavy tail distribution is something we're not very good at right now. All right, so for the last 20 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the area of computational microeconomics. I'm going to give you a couple of what seem like stylized but extremely real examples of, of things we've done right and wrong in the industry uh, and, this, and the technical problems that arise. Okay, so this has to do with you know, advertisement. Okay, so recall this uh, picture I showed you at the beginning. I showed you a Microsoft example at the beginning. This one's a Yahoo example. So you come in and type a query. In this case, it's Canon camera but misspelled. Okay, uh, and while well, we do spell correction and put up good algorithmic results, we also put up a bunch of ads having to do with cameras. Okay, and you say, wow, that's great. Uh, even though Canon was misspelled, we somehow put the right ads. Actually, it's not at all miraculous. I'll show you in a moment why this is trivial. Okay, all right. So the stuff on the right is search advertising, and let me explain to you how this works. Right, if you were to click on that link that I had there, the whoops, the blue circled ad you get to something that we call a landing page, which is where the advertiser wants you to come so that they can try and sell you stuff. Okay? All right. Uh, how does this work? So you have the advertiser. They have a landing page, and you have a sponsored search engine, which could be Google, Yahoo, Microsoft. Most advertisers will invest varying amounts of advertising in different engines. Okay? Now, the advertiser expresses himself to the engine in a certain stylized bidding language, and here's the kind of thing they get to say. They'll say, I want to bid $5.00. On, on the keyword phrase Canon camera. This one spelled correctly. Okay? The semantics of this is if somebody searches for Canon camera and then click through on my ad and come to my landing page, then I'm willing to pay up to $5. Okay? And due to uh, intricacies of auction theory and pricing that I won't talk about today, you will typically charge the advertiser somewhat less than what they bid. The same advertiser may concurrently place many bids. So for instance, the same advertiser might say, I want to bid $2 on misspelled Canon camera. Okay. This isn't because they necessarily think that somebody misspells Canon is stupid and so uh, worth less money. It's actually the market is thinner on misspellings. Not if all the advertisers bid on, on misspellings. So you have to compete less. And the precise sense in which you compete for placement is something I'll explain in a moment. Okay. So you place a whole bunch of these ads. The engine which has an ad index where all these ads go, decides when and where to show this ad, and also how much to charge the advertiser on a click. Okay? So there's the ad, and if somebody clicks, they get sent to the landing page. Okay? So the monetization, the way it works, is when a searcher clicks on an ad, the advertiser pays. So this is not, you don't get money just for showing the ad, you actually have to get clicked on. Right? So a Ford dealership may place an ad for Ford, and of all such ads, the engine decides which ones to show. Right now, you should already be thinking about how does it decide of all the people who want to bid on Ford, which ad should I put up, right? Uh, and you probably come up with the one natural solution that I'll talk about in a second. Okay. Uh, so the engine essentially is solving three subproblems. It's matching ads to a query. Okay. Remember that the query that gets typed in may be something that's never been bid on by anybody. Okay. 
Uh, then it has to order the ads from top to bottom. Okay, this red arrow shows top to bottom, and I'll explain why in a moment. And finally, it has to determine the price on a click-through. Okay. Now, the first two problems, matching ads to a query and ordering them, is a problem of information retrieval. It's a search problem. Right? The latter two turn out to be problems in economics as well. Okay. And I'll explain why in a moment. And in particular, the middle one is what I'll focus on. How do you order the ads? Because that really lies at the intersection of, sort of classical search and information retrieval together with microeconomics. Right. So to set these concepts, uh, I'm going to show you this query from Google. So you type the query Tundra, and on the left, you have the climatic zone, which is you know, the tundra as, uh, as a part of the Earth. On the right, notice that in somewhat stark contrast, the ads are all about trucks. Okay? Uh, so this is a case where the left and right sides really have very little to do with each other. But in some sense, both are right. Okay? So if you have a commercial intent, you're probably going to be more interested in the stuff. So, uh, so Google has a bunch of people who bid on the keyword Tundra, and it decided to order them in this fashion. Now, curiously, you'll notice that the top ad in this is for the Nissan Titan, which is a competitor to the Toyota Tundra. Right? So it's not an ad for the Toyota Tundra, but to, for a competitor. That's actually OK. Uh, in the United States, it's legal to bid on a competitor's trademarks uh, by a Supreme Court decision. All right, so, so what I want you to take away from this, ads go into slots like this. In this case, there are four slots. Okay. Now, eye tracking and user behavior studies have shown that slots at the higher up get more clicks because your eyes kind of, when you look at a search results page, your eyes naturally gravitate to the north and the east. Okay. So the more northeast you are, the better. So advertisers like to vie for the top spot, and then failing that, the next spot, and then the next spot, and the next spot. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you now is a little bit about how an engine, in this case Google, uh, but any engine, actually decides which ad should come higher up and which ones come lower down. Okay. Now, this whole business of search advertising was uh, pioneered by a man named Bill Gross, uh, who founded a company back then used to be called GoTo. It changed its name to Overture, which was acquired by Yahoo. And he had a simple idea. Right? Order the ads from top to bottom by bid. What that means is somebody who bids $5 gets top billing. The person who bids $4.50 gets second place, $3 next, $2 next, and so on. So take all the people bidding on, uh, in this case, 747, and put the highest bidder on top, the second highest bidder. Okay. Now you look at this example, and you immediately know something is wrong. Uh, in fact, this is fairly commonplace uh, to see eBay and shopping.com as, as the top placed advertising. Right? Now, most people don't buy 747s on eBay, right? So uh, there's something wrong here. What eBay is doing here is, is basically spamming this ad engine by putting a high bid on everything, right? Uh, I've seen lots of professors whom, who show up as a, whose names show up as the top uh, ad being eBay. Right? Uh, what eBay is doing bids high on everything. And they can afford to do it because they don't pay unless somebody clicks. And nobody looking for a professor is going to click on that ad. However, by being positioned there, they're constantly reminding of their existence. So this is a form of free brand advertising. Right? OK. Uh, so, so clearly, uh, the idea of simply ordering by bid has this flaw in it. And in fact, after Yahoo acquired Overture, until about two years ago, we kept using the scheme. And my estimate is we lost at least a good chunk of a billion dollars doing this. Okay. All right. So, so here's a slightly more sophisticated scheme that's attributed to Google, but what Google does today is far more sophisticated. Uh, what everybody today is, does today is far more sophisticated. So the idea is that you associate with each advertisement a click-through rate, okay, which is what fraction of the time you show it does it get clicked on. Right. So, so you have these statistics you've compiled from history that says, from the times I've shown this ad, 2% of the time people actually click on it, or something. Right? That's a click-through rate. We also have, for each ad, a bid. Okay? How much did the advertiser bid for it? Okay. You multiply the two, you get a proxy for the expected revenue from that ad. Right? Uh, it's a proxy because what you actually charge is somewhat less than the bid determined by a complicated pricing formula. But let's say, to a first order, it's the bid. Okay? So you have the expected revenue from an ad. And revenue ordering, the scheme says, order the ads from top to bottom by expected revenue. Okay? And as is classical in uh, most uh, 
you know, machine learning or statistical uh, prediction, you can smooth this so that on day one, when you have no data on the click-through rate of, of an ad, you keep some sort of token number around, then you update it over time. Okay, all right. Uh, so on the same day I ran that query on Yahoo, which is uh, about two years ago, I ran it on Google. The eBay ad does show up, but it shows up much lower. Okay, and the reason is that because nobody is clicking through on that ad, CTR for that ad is low, so the expected revenue is low, and so Google sank it to to being near the bottom of the list. Make sense? Okay. Now you might think that's the end of the story because revenue ordering would say take the ad with highest expected revenue and put it up in the slot that's most likely to be cl clicked on. Right? Take the ad with the second highest expected revenue, put it in the second best slot, and so on. And you might say that's the end of the story. Actually, it's not. Okay? And this is where, uh, well, we'd be making two mistakes uh, of the kind that computer scientists might make, but an economist will say is completely daft. Right? The, the first mistake would be to order by bed, right? and that was a sort of a software engineer solution, but an economist looks at it and says, you'd never do that. Uh, doing this is still not quite the right thing. Okay. By the way, the, after we implemented uh, something like revenue ordering, we too pushed the eBay ad down. Okay. All right. So bid and revenue ordering are, in a sense, two forms of ordering ads by a score that depends on an economic factor, in this case, the bid. So you might ask the question, does revenue order maximize the expected revenue? The right way to think about this is, is multiplayer games, because the way to think about it is, uh, I have a scheme. It could be revenue ordering. And I should be prepared to announce it to the world, saying I'm going to do revenue ordering. And now you guys are all gamers. You're all adversaries. And you want to f fight the system to your advantage. Okay? Uh, so you're going to react by changing your bidding behavior. Okay? This is especially true, because this is what we call a repeated game, because you Place a bid and then you update it. On real keywords, bids change a few hundred times a second. Okay, and most bids are not done by people typing bids; they're done by robots. Okay, so so you ask, does revenue ordering maximize revenue? Well, I have to assume that you're game theoretically rational, and if I tell you I'm using re revenue ordering, you're going to do something different. In fact, uh, that's what happens. Advertisers react to the ordering scheme by changing the bidding, bidding behavior. Okay, so they try to game the scheme. Uh, there's a nice paper by Lahey and Panak uh, from the EC conference in 2007 that actually says the following. Uh, they consider a family of schemes that bridge bid and revenue ordering. Bid ordering is just by bid, revenue is by revenue. Uh, what you can do is take the bid and multiply it by the click-through rate raised to some power alpha, where alpha is between 0 and 1. If it's 0, it's 1 end. If it's 1, it's the, the revenue end. And they show that there are non-trivial values of alpha where in a game theoretic equilibrium between the auctioneer and the players, you maximize revenue. And this is something they then validated empirically on, on Yahoo data. Okay. So the point I want to make here is the design of these auctions and the design of these ordering schemes can have a deep impact on revenue. And it's not as simple as let's just do the thing that makes the most sense, is the easiest to code or whatever. Uh, People out there are quite smart, they're rational, and they will do these things to react to the things that you do. Okay. All right, so there's a whole bunch of questions that come up here. So how do you express a bit? I told you, you get to come and say, I bid $5 on, on Canon camera. In fact, advertisers don't want to bid on keywords. What they want to do is buy segments, like people interested in buying a camera. And today, we kind of force them in a strange way. So one of the things we're looking at is expressive bidding languages that get to say more than, here's the keyword I want to buy. Right? Uh, the bidding mechanism in terms of uh, is itself a fascinating object. So let me give you an example that, uh, of reserve pricing. Okay? Uh, so about 30 years ago, a man named Roger Meyerson, an economist, uh, devised a theory of reserve pricing in an auction. So what that means is if I'm selling an item, say my Blackberry, each place a bid. But I can have, as an auctioneer, the reserve price, the minimum I'll sell it for. So I'll say, you know, if nobody build, bids below $10, I'm not going to sell this thing. Right. right. So Myerson developed this theory. Uh, last year, he got the Nobel Prize for his theory. What's interesting is right around now, uh, companies like Google and Yahoo are implementing this in the keyword auction setting. And it actually makes a swing, I'll say, of hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Uh, so what's the setting here? In keyword auctions, 
classically, we used to set a fixed reserve price of 10 cents on every keyword. Okay. And that doesn't really make sense, because there are some keyword markets where you want to raise the reserve price, and others where you want to drop it. Right? So you want to dynamically set reserve prices. Now, Myerson and his theory assumed that you know the bidder's values in setting the reserve price. We don't know the uh, bidder's values when we set the reserve price. We only know their bids. So, so, so due to some theory developed by uh, Michael Schwartz, we came up with a scheme where you can dynamically set reserve prices in a way that, say, maximizes revenue. You can set multiple objective functions in this. Okay? So that's an example of market design that actually makes a huge difference in the revenue you make, the system makes. Right? What information do you share with advertisers? Right? So when advertisers come in to bid, they want to know what everybody else is bidding. Do you really tell them all the information? Right? That's, again, a parameter in marketplace design. Okay? Uh, how do you price a contract for the future? Suppose somebody doesn't want to bid for today, but they want to bid for 10 days from now. Uh, this is something we don't really understand. Uh, advertising is increasingly getting into something called exchanges, where you can buy a bundle of advertising from one party and then resell it to another. This starts to get into situations where you may be able to buy on the basis of the number of times an ad is shown, and then sell it in terms of the number of clicks it gets. Right? So you're doing risk management there between buying in one form of instrument and selling in a different form. Right? Uh, and this has you know, lots of antecedents ranging from the insurance industry to the airline industry, except the main thing that changes is our scale is dramatically bigger. To give you some sense, um, the number of ads in our database is hundreds of millions. Okay. Uh, so that's the scale at which uh, we have to operate. The number of advertisers is of the order of tens of millions. Okay. Right. Um, so there's some parallels from things like yield management, but at the same time, the stuff we're doing, because we have these two supply chains, uh, is actually an area where we cannot apply most of the classical theory. Okay. Uh, so for instance, the number of seats in a plane is fixed. The number of eyeballs that will show up in a day is not fixed. It's stochastic. Okay. You also want certain notions of uniformity and fairness. If you want people bidding uh, people typing a keyword from California, you want to make sure they're not all from Berkeley, California. You want to have some notion of uniformity. So these are, again, naughty problems that somehow sit between econ, OR, and uh, computer science that we don't quite understand today. Uh, I have economist colleagues who will come up with these beautiful solutions. Uh, and you look at it carefully, and you say, well, how long does this algorithm run? And the answer is, well, it'll, it's guaranteed to converge eventually. Right? Uh, and you say, no, no, eventually it's not good enough. You know, uh, I need either real time or near time convergence. And we have no clue uh, how to do most of these things. Uh, the sort of takeaway for me from working uh, in this position is that in the internet industry, R&D is not some upstream function where a bunch of us software engineers do something, and then the marketing and pricing people go off and do their thing. It's actually very closely tied. Uh, the economics in the marketplace has to be built into the product design, uh, both from an audience side, the engagement of the audience, and from the advertiser side. Otherwise, you know, we as software engineers make decisions we think of as software engineering decisions or computer science issues, and it turns out to be a disaster from the standpoint of either a user experience or a marketplace design. Uh, and we cannot afford that. I gave you an example just in bid ordering. Uh, where, by any measure, a good chunk of a billion dollars disappeared from the Yahoo balance sheet for that reason. So the, the net is that there's no single discipline that has all the answers. Uh, what you need to do is combine your understanding of cognitive psychology and ethnography and sociology uh, together with your understanding of rational markets, and yet you get to solve these huge problems uh, uh, at uh, ridiculously fast speeds uh, on you know, large cloud computing clusters. That's sort of the mouthful, but that's really uh, the, the gamut of technical work that we get to do. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, of the task, yeah. But you didn't talk at all about trying to communicate. 
Yeah, so, uh, all right, so that's, uh, that's actually a bit of a loaded question. And uh, I think, not the most recent quarter, but the previous quarter, Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google, uh, made the following comment on their uh, financial analyst call. He said, uh, uh, social networks are proving notoriously hard to monetize, okay? Uh, so what that's code word for is people doing mail and instant messenger in Facebook and MySpace don't seem to be particularly susceptible to advertising. Okay. Uh, to give you an idea, running a large mail operation, so at Yahoo we have about 300 million active users of uh, email, uh, is an incredibly expensive proposition, especially when we're all in this arms race of, uh, well, Gmail started this thing of one gig free email, which is now up to about six gig. Uh, so Yahoo you know, countered by saying infinite email, right, which is what we uh, tell. So the CapEx costs to run a big email operation are inordinately large. Okay? Uh, in our business, it's the thinnest margin part of the business because the revenue comes from advertising, but it's advertising to people who aren't really paying attention, who are in no mood to pay attention because they want to do their email, they don't want to be distracted by this other stuff. Whereas when you're there to consume, there's actually a hope that you get somewhat branded. So the short answer is we haven't really figured out uh, what the right monetization mechanism is in the communicator network pieces. There are people we have, and I'm sure at Microsoft and Google as well, who are thinking about how do you get people in your social network to, to how do you target them with products you purchased? Okay, so for instance, you bought a new camera and your friends learn about it. Uh, so here's a very interesting uh, data point that uh, one of our summer interns came up with. Uh, so do people know what Flickr is? Right, Flickr is a large photo sharing site, right? Uh, so on Flickr, besides sharing photos, you can declare friends, okay? Uh, there's an abnormally high correlation of the camera models owned by pairs of friends. Okay, we don't know why, but there must be something in there, right? So that's the kind of thing we look to, to say how could you potentially monetize the communicate part of this. Uh, evidently, people are recommending cameras to each other, but we don't tap that today. Yeah. 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 So typically, we model click-through rates uh, for things like advertisements or even for stories as a product of a couple of different things, uh, or some you know functional composition of two things. One is an intrinsic measure of clickability. The other is position dependent. Like, did I put it up here or down here, and so on. So we do do that. And that's a fairly standard assumption. Yeah. So, so I would say that, right, uh, the problems have gotten bigger. Uh, now, it is true that our computers are faster, but still not that much faster, right? Uh, so I, I'd say that if you look at the work we've been doing on computational microeconomics across the industry and you know our academic friends, I'd say that uh, they fall into two pockets. There's sort of simple uh, auction design that really doesn't impact computation very heavily, okay? And then there's stuff like pricing futures contracts that we're really pretty clueless about. Okay, uh, and meaning it hasn't gotten computationally easier, and we don't have you know that many better methods. So we are messing around with forms of objective functions that makes it easier to factor and stuff like that. Not yet, and you know, if if I had to summarize, you know, what I'm here with this talk is to hopefully spur you all into devising the fundamental insights. Oh, it's, it's latent in everything we're talking about here. So for instance, when, when I parse a document or an advertising, right, statistical natural language processing is all over it, right? When I pull out entities, all of that stuff. And then the user saying what he wants. Oh, okay. So uh, historically as an industry, we've been unsuccessful at prompting users uh, to tell us expressively what they want. So people, seem more comfortable typing two keywords five times in sequence 
rather than a 10, cent, 10 keyword sentence saying what they're doing, right? And we've, as an industry, tried things like widening the search box and saying, you know, go ahead and enter your description. And people just don't seem to do it. And it may simply that most users' cognitive models of efficiently getting to the answer is still stuck in the keyword paradigm. Right? But we haven't seen the, the behavior that would lift that. Yeah. Well, so uh, you have to understand that uh, implicitly we already do a fair bit. Now, there's also a boundary of decency and privacy. So, for instance, if you're doing a query from a GSM phone, uh, a GPS enabled phone, right, uh, we could take all of that information. We take some of it. So, at the level of cell tower, it's considered common decency today. Uh, knowing exactly where you're in the street, we don't do today. So, yeah, we do more than just the keywords already. Yeah, we have, and the results are encouraging, but there's also a policy issue here uh, where actually Google stands apart from the industry. Google actually uh, considers it legit to look at the content in your emails as features. The rest of the industry doesn't, right? So the only features we look at are your IP address and your registration and stuff, but not the content of your email, right? We don't have evidence, and of course, the, the Google doesn't break down these numbers. We don't have evidence that Gmail monitors us any significantly better than other forms of email. Yeah, so, so I think uh, the law of large numbers is a perfectly good tool when you're really looking at statistics of independently observed behavioral variables, right? Uh, in this world of people influencing each other pretty heavily, and that increases as people network you know, beyond the physical world, it's not clear that you, the independence assumptions are retained. It could be, right? So if you look at log normal distributions, for instance, in the log space, it behaves pretty independently. I mean, it, not additively, right? And that's a tool we've been using. But then the random variables that you start to look at become pretty unwieldy from the standpoint of fine prediction. Right? Uh huh. Well, but we do have to target humans at the end of the day, right? We have to target a human sitting at a particular browser doing a particular activity, right? Right, yeah. right. So, so we do do that, and uh, at that level of at a certain level of granularity, it works fine. Once you get yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, you mean second life kinds of. Them? I don't know if it will be as ubiquitous by any means. I just think of it as part of the web continuum, where you have experiences ranging from sort of ephemeral to sort of long-lasting. People live on Second Life for, for a long time, right? It's not like I do a search and go away, or I read a piece of news and go away. And the first order of what we believe is people want a range of experiences in, in these various dimensions, from ephemerality to, to sort of lasting, uh, to things they carry with them. Uh, so. Uh, so I think there's definitely going to be a role. I don't think it's going to be anything as ubiquitous as the web. And my colleagues who are into ethnography, uh, will, uh, they tend to tell me that there's a role in our lives for sort of the Facebook style of interaction as distinct from the second life style of interaction, as distinct from email. So each of these persists and serves a different function in, in the set of things you do. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So do you, are, are you looking at something like a, an options market for the keyword 
Yeah, we are looking into instruments that uh, uh, both options markets for keywords, but also in terms of any advertising, uh, buying and selling on different bases in terms of risk, right? Uh, buying bundles of eyeballs and selling bundles of clicks, right? Uh, definitely. And how do you price that in my answer? Yeah. How do you work the business model? The business model. Yeah. You, you mentioned behavioral economics. Yeah. Uh, right. Have we developed any model that? Oh, uh, have we developed? I mean, extremely primitively, I would say. Well, online learning in the sense that machine learning people use it, absolutely, yes. Uh, not in terms of competitive ratio explicitly. Okay, thank you.